Are y'all ready for the word? All right, once again, give it up for We Are Zion Music. Phenomenal. I want to thank God for my beautiful wife who's been sitting in almost every service. Got the church hat on, I'm telling you, doing it for Easter. My wife has been listening to me preach the same sermon all day for 70 years. Amen. <laughs> Amen. She always says, that was good. Good job. Good job. I'm so encouraged about that. Amen. Hey, I'm starting a new series today. I forgot. I can't dismiss y'all yet. I'm starting a new series today. It's a four-part series, Pastor Green. It's called God's Family. Everybody say God's Family. Amen. Yeah, we're going to talk about that for the next four weeks. And to get us ready for it, we're going back to 1979, before most of this band was even born. Let me see if y'all remember this one. Anybody remember that song? 1979 at the Capitol Center. The back to school boogie. Anyway, all right, we are family, y'all. With all of our quirkiness and all of our dysfunction, we still a family. We fuss and fight, but we still family. We argue with each other and have our own idiosyncrasies, but we're still family. We have different backgrounds and different beliefs, but we're still family. We are more family than, you know why? We are blood relatives because of the blood of Jesus that has dripped on all of us. That's, we are the family of God. Amen. And in this series, we're going to be talking about what he expects of his family. What, is he, what does he expect of our devotion to him? What does he expect of us as it relates to church leadership? What is, what is our responsibility in our interpersonal relationships with each other? What, is he, what does he say about the pneumatic teachings? And I want, to go, I want to go into a book in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I believe is content that we can use during this series, and I'm going to break it up again into four parts. So if you have access to a Bible and you want to follow along in it, join me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to look at five verses today as we open up part one. Now, if you are physically able to stand with me as I read these verses without harm to yourself, please join me in standing now. I'm going to read verse 11. Then I'm going to read the last clause in verse 13. I'm going to read verses 14 and 15, and I'm going to read verse 26. And those are going to be the verses we focus on today as we talk about the, the importance of interpersonal relationships in God's family. It starts off in verse 11 by saying these words, therefore, encourage one another. Now, when you see the word therefore, you got to ask, what's the therefore, therefore, right? And the, the, the therefore is there for this reason. It is going back to all the way to chapter 4, verse 13 to 18, and then chapters 5, verses 1 to 10, where there's what is called eschatological information. It is talking about things of the future, particularly the rapture of the church. And it's saying that when people die who are believers, we don't have to sorrow like people who have no hope. Because there is a, there is a life beyond this life. And that's what all the verses leading up to this is about. And they say, encourage one another with these words. And, and, and we don't have time to do an eschatological teaching on, at this time, but I want you to know what's happening when we get into verse 11. It says, therefore, in light of the fact that we have hope beyond this life, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So I'm going to do this a little different. It says, encourage one another. Everybody say, one another. One another. Then it says, and build each other up. Everybody say, each other. Each other. Just as, in fact, you are doing. Now, go down to verse 13. I just want to read the last clause in verse 13. It says, live in peace with each other. Live in peace with who? Each other. 
Each other, yeah, each other, each other. Verse 14, verse 14 says, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. Verse 15, and make sure that nobody is petty. <laughs> petty Crocker, Richard Petty, Petty Coat Junction, Pays back. No, I'm sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong because two wrongs don't. Yeah, but always strive to do what is good for who? Each other. It's about each other, each other, each other, and for everyone else. Verse 26. Yeah, verse 26 says, "Great, greet all God's people with a holy kiss." Uh oh. <laughs> all you single people, that's your moment. You've been, if you've been. You've been feeling somebody in here, you like somebody, that's your moment. The Bible says you can go give them a holy kiss right now. They just, even if they don't believe it, they should, you should. God did. You didn't want me to kiss you? God did. Amen. Let's pray. Father, please speak to us through your word. Your servants are listening in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Over and over again in this passage, you see the word one another or each other, uh, live in peace with each other, build up each other, encourage one another. Paul is making it clear to the, to the church of Thessalonica that we're not in this by ourselves. We're all in this together. And Christianity is a one another religion. It is about each other. And my subject today is love each other. 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 Say that with me. Love each other. Again, love each other. One more time. Love each other. In a world in which we live, when we don't know how much more time we're going to have with the people we love, it is so important to love each other. When you don't know what the person near you has on them and that they're carrying and the weight of the world on their life, it is so important that we love each other and that people know that we love them. Away with this stuff, you know, it's understood. And you, ever, you know, I grew up in a generation, you had to ask the parents, do you love me? If I ain't love you, you wouldn't have nothing to eat. Like, it's like we couldn't say it. We couldn't say it. But then we say it to caskets. And we stand on, I see it all the time. This is the work I do. We stand on podiums and we look at the casket and we talk to somebody who can't hear us. You know I love you. In a world where people are losing their lives over the ridiculous stuff by gun violence, it is so important that we love each other. The world is in need, Stevie Wonder, of love today. So don't delay. Is that Stevie Wonder? Send yours in. Amen. Just two people that don't listen to the gospel. One more time, everybody say, love each other. If you don't take nothing else away from here, take that with you. Love each other. In fact, some of you need to text somebody you love right now and just say, I just want you to know I love you. I said, I ain't want nothing. I just want you to know I love you. Some of you are going to get a text back and say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Somebody died, what's going on? Like, no, I love you. So I just wanted to say I love you. No complaints. No, I love you. And can you put the trash out, please? No, just, just love you. I didn't plan on sharing this story. I remember when I was a youth pastor at a church in Rockville, Maryland, and one of our students died unexpectedly at Clark University. And um, I remember talking to his mom and the, the, the sad part about it, as she told me, was that when they went down to the university to identify his body, she had to fly back on a plane to Maryland with her son under the plane in a casket. And she said, they, they used to call me Reverend Battle back then. She said, Reverend Battle, she says, I used to always complain to him about how loud his music was in the house. 
I ain't gotta have that loud music, that loud music, that loud music. She said, I'd give anything to hear that music again. Love each other. Love each other. The stuff we complain about is not even worth it. I'm just glad you're still here. If you live by yourself, it has its benefits. It does, it does. You know, you, you, can, you, you don't even have to bathe all the time. It's just like, <laughs> I don't know who you gonna offend? You're just offending yourself. You, you gotta tell yourself, you need a shower right now. You just need to go. But if you, know, if you work from home too, like, you know, you don't, if you, you don't have to worry about what you wear. Like, you can roll the toilet paper down. You can pull it up. But don't, you can just leave it on the key. You only have to put it on the roll. You can push the toothpaste wherever you want to push it. Bottom, top, middle, no complaints. You, 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 can, you can, this is what I love, you can set the temperature to whatever you want it to be in your house. It is, it is some benefits to living by yourself. No arguments. You can watch what you want to watch. You can do whatever you want to do. You clean up when you're ready. And there's no, it's, it, it may be a little lonely sometimes to live by yourself, but it's peaceful. If there's arguments going on in your house and you live alone, we do have people here at the service who would be willing to work with you about that. We, you know, we, we're serious about that, but for the most part, <laughs> it's, it, is, it, is, it is peaceful to be home. But the moment you go from living by yourself to letting one person live with you, I don't care if they're your bestie for life. It could be your family member. It could be your, your, your soulmate. Y'all met at the Frankie Beverly concert and at the Bruno Mars concert and b fell in love at first sight. I don't care who it is. It's only a matter of time before after a while you be saying, I don't know if I should have let this person move in. It just, it just mess your rhythm up. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, you don't even know what to say. I just don't know. I just don't like the way. I, they're going to do something. They're going to leave something undone. They're going to say something. They're going to leave something unsaid. How many know I'm telling the truth right now? They just mess your whole groove up. It ain't that you don't like them. It's just that coexisting is hard. You cannot be in somebody else's space and they not even to themselves saying, you make me sick. They don't say it out loud. They say, you make me sick. Now, imagine that disruption. Let's say it wasn't just one person that came to live with you. They brought people with them. The whole family came. Like about three or four of them came into your house. And you know, people have a rough time. You say, no, why don't y'all just come on, stay with us till you get back on your feet. Just stay here for a couple of weeks. We got space for you. And then by day three, you'd be like, why did I? Look, how, much, how many more hours is it <laughs> till, till these last 11 days go? You don't want to come home because it is disruptive to have people in your space. Now that's just two or three people. Imagine you multiply that by 100. It's not apples and apples because we don't live with each other in the church family, but the more people you have, the more opportunities for tension. That's just, that's just how it goes. It's just like there's tension. See, but when you're in your house and you're not getting along with people, you just go in your room, close the door, lock the door, and that's a message to people, leave me alone. Or when you ought to intentionally stay out of the house to avoid being with them, you can do that. But when you come to church, it's hard to avoid people. So you go to 1.30 service because you don't like the people to go to 9.45. That's what you do. <laughs> or, you, or you come in and you don't speak to people you're beefing with. And say, I'm just here for the word. I'm here for the worship. I ain't playing no games. I ain't got no time for you. But God says, love each other. By the way, he doesn't say like each other. Like is preferential. Love comes from God. And he loves everybody. So he gives us the capacity to love. Because you can love somebody that you don't like. Love is powerful. It is stronger than like. And so, so in this passage, we start in verse 11. And it's five verses. And there are 11 things that we can use to help us love each other. I'm going to go through them quickly. The first two are in verse 11. When you look at verse 11, it tells us to do two things. Encourage one another and build each other up. That's one and two. Now, what is interesting about those two commands is that they seem to be similar. Like, it almost seemed like redundancy. Encourage people, encourage one another, build each other up. But it's actually, they're actually polar opposites. To encourage a person is a comforting word. It literally means to hold somebody up 
when they're up under pressure or grief or difficulty in their life. It means to hold somebody up. But then Paul uses a term for a human being that pictures them like a building when he says, build them up. That's not a comforting word. It's actually a strengthening and a correcting word. To build something up is a construction word. And you don't have construction without mess. In order to help build somebody up, you got to knock down walls, you got to install floors, you got to put in space and build out rooms. That's messy work. And it's corrective work. It is discipleship. It is mentorship. It is challenging somebody about their words, their behavior, their conduct, their character. So on the one hand, he says, encourage one another. That's comfort them. On the other hand, he's saying, build them up. That's correcting them. And both of them are love. You can't have a house, even a regular house, where there's only comfort and no correction. If in your house all there is is comfort all the time and there's no correction, you have no maturity, no growth. If you have a house where there's only correction all the time and no comfort, you have no connection. Hey, all correction, no connection. People don't want to be around a person who only corrects them all the time. That's why the correcting parent, the correcting parent is always correcting. When you come in the house, everybody wants to leave the room. So you have to have both. The problem is, look at, look at, look at Romans 14.9. Paul brings this issue up again in another verse, and he says, let us, this, I want us to aim for harmony. Everybody say harmony. Let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. He makes a distinction right here again. He says, I want harmony. That's comfort. I want us to all get along, but let's aim for that while we're also trying to build people up. Because that's the part people don't like. They like the comfort. They don't like the correction. Because people get defensive when you try to build them up and disciple them and correct them and correct them and talk to them about their lifestyle. They get all on the defense. In fact, everybody's cool till you correct them. Once you start correcting people, then they start hearing from God. <laughs> yeah, you know, the Spirit of the Lord told me, man, I, was, I wasn't even expecting this. He told me it's time to move. My season's up here. It's time for me to move on, follow the cloud. Well, you didn't hear from the Lord when you were getting comforted. As soon as somebody tried to correct you, now you're hearing from the Lord. And many people who, 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 who claim they've experienced church hurt, and I'm not saying church hurt is not real, but many people who claim it really just didn't want to get corrected. And so, and so when you call, you call accountability toxicity. So now, as soon as somebody tries to correct you, now you move on, move out, and you should never write this, write this. When you move on to the next church or the next football team or the next staff group you're on or the next relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever you're with, you always inform them about how toxic the last relationship was and how toxic the last group was so that they will be behaving themselves in a way that, that, that condescends to your immaturity. Because you're giving them the boundaries. Don't ever do that because those people were controlling. They weren't controlling. They were trying to hold you accountable. Yeah. But when this is how you know a person doesn't like to be corrected. Because everywhere you go, you're always an expert on what happened to you, but you don't know anything about what's wrong with you. Because nobody can ever tell you what's wrong with you. Who am I? Yeah, nobody can ever tell you what's wrong with you. Because as soon as somebody tell you what's wrong with you, you go into. You're always a victim. Like you have never. You, you in all of your relationships, all you, you got fired. You were a victim. You mean you were always on time to work? You were never late. You were never on TikTok when you were supposed to be working. Like you are that much of a. You are that righteous. Like you are not culpable for anything that's ever happened to you. So you're on your fifth job, your fifth marriage, your fifth church, and everybody was wrong. And I'm saying that's a person doesn't want to be corrected. It's as simple as that. You can bless me, but don't be trying to build me up. Don't be all up in my stuff. But let me say something. Correction is just as much love as comfort because I don't know of a parent that wouldn't correct their child out of love. Think about this. Let's say a bunch of children are hanging outside on the streets and then, out of, you know, they, they're hanging out on the streets and you don't know all of them, but you know yours is out there. <laughs> the reason why you pulling yours out of the middle of the night is because I'm coming again. I can't speak. And they say, well, they get to say out there, you be saying, them ain't my kids. You belong to me. 
You belong to me. You belong to me. So I'm co- be- out of love, I'm correcting you. See, I don't have time to correct people out on love. If I correct you, I believe in you enough because if I ain't got time, if, listen, if I ain't love you, I'm done with you. And God says you can't just be done with people in our family. You, you can't just, you can't just, what we do is, as soon as somebody crosses the line, we cancel them, we block them, we hear from God, we, we unfollow them, where the Lord told us to move on. But here's, Romans 12, 8 says this, in Romans 12, 8 it says, do all that you can to live at peace with others. Which leads me, which leads me, by the way, to, to the next point in verse 13, verse 13 says, live at peace with each other. That's part of loving. Live, when there's a command to live in peace with each other, that's a, that's a sure sign that it's not natural. Because Paul understands that people in peace are not synonymous. Whenever you put a lot of people in, it is impossible to work together, to live together, to serve together, and somebody not rub you wrong. How many of you know that? Oh, yeah, yeah, you came out your mouth. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I ain't, I ain't like the way you said that. I ain't like the way you did that. I ain't like the way you walked in. Some of us has, get off on the wrong foot with people. You ever had somebody from day one, you'd be like, you know what? Something in my spirit. Do you need that? This is something in my spirit about that. You know what I mean? Nah, nah. Or you feel that way because somebody else told you something about it. You don't even know the person. Somebody told you something about it from their experience instead of them telling the person themselves. They told you about them. Now you feel some kind of way about a person. You don't even know because the person gossiped to you about them. And a lot of relationships are forged like that and it creates tension and division and cliques and, and pockets of people in the family of God. And he says we're supposed to love each other. Love each other. Now, let me give you a tool to help us avoid this because it's not okay to talk about people if you're not going to talk to them. If they offended you that much that you, that you had to share it with somebody else that had nothing to do with it, then why haven't you gone to them about it? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's just as wrong as whatever they did. Right? right? So here's, what, here's a tool that we use that I got this from Pastor Jenkins, John Jenkins of First Baptist Church of Glenard, and this tool, he calls it an SBI which is when you start with a situation and then you point out behavior. The B is for behavior and the I is for impact. Situation, behavior, impact. This is how you approach somebody who has offended you. You go to them. Don't go to them while you're still angry and you're crying and you're shaking. You want to calm down enough so that you can have a civil conversation about them. And you say, hey, man, I talked to you about something. He says, and then you start with a situation. Hey, you know what? Last Thursday, when we were out in the parking lot, um, you started joning, making fun of me, and you did it in front of other people. And I don't know if you noticed it. I wasn't really laughing. And, the imp- and it really embarrassed me. And I just wanted to bring that to your attention because I've been holding it and it really has hurt me for days because I never, I never thought you would do that to me, right? Now, now the reason why you had to talk to them because you probably call somebody else and say, you know what so-and-so did and know something down there and they, they're thinking negatively about it. Your first move is to go, let me give you the Bible for this. Matthew chapter 18. This is where this comes from out of the Bible. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, it says, when one of my followers sins against you, this is Jesus talking, go and point out what was wrong, but do it in private, just between the two of you. The, if the person listens, you won back a follower. If they, and I'm going to show you how you can know if they listen in the second part of this. But if they don't listen, if they like, get out of here with that, just, you can't take a joke. You think I would be petty like that? You don't know me by now? Now you're making it about you. It's not supposed to be about you. You're supposed to listen and be compassionate to this person who you've hurt. So if they don't listen the first time, you go back, round two. Now you move from a private confrontation to a private conference. You still don't involve everybody. You just take one or two others. They refuse to leave. Take one or two others with you. Not to jump them saying, so now what you're going to do? We're not doing that. It's a conversation. Because the goal is to take some mature people with you so that you can help them under, you can help the offender understand what they've done. This is what he's trying to tell you that you did. This is what she's trying to say. And we want to make sure you hear it. If, that, if they still resist it, 
Then the next move is you go and you tell it, if they refuse to listen to them, report the matter to the church. That's not going on the church's website. It's going to a leader in the church and letting the leader in the church know what has happened. And if that's step three, if they refuse to listen to the church, step four is you treat the person like an unbeliever or a tax collector, which was during that time one of the worst people. And you just treat them like, you know what? This person doesn't listen. They, they, they're not up to being reproved or corrected. Just understand that about this person. That's four stages. What I'm saying we cancel them at stage one and start talking about them. But it starts with going to them alone, saying, here's the situation, here's what you did, here's the impact. Don't tell them what their intention was. You don't say, and you meant to do that because you're that kind of person or you were trying to hurt my feelings. No, just say, this is the facts. This is when, when it happened. This is what happened. This is how it made me feel. If that happens, if somebody comes to you and tries to do that and has that conversation, your responsibility as the offender is to do this. This is a tool that I developed. It's called Luvafa. Lufafa. Luvafa. I don't know what to call it. Just, that's what it is. But you start by listening first. And you listen with the goal of understanding. You don't listen to fire back on them There's like it's a, a courtroom scene, like, oh, I know you ain't coming with that because it wasn't even Thursday, it was Wednesday, because I remember what I had on. <laughs> now you want to argue facts with the people. Uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Weiss says, to understand a person means you humble yourself, you stand under them so that they can teach you what it was like to be them in the situation. I want to understand. I can tell you're hurt. I want to understand what I did. You can't be defensive. You got you to gotta love each other. You got to be, be more concerned about the relationship than your reputation. You got to be more concerned about the relationship than your reputation. You got to be more concerned about the relationship than your reputation. You got to be more concerned about the relationship than your reputation. And then once you hear what they say, you know, when we were outside and you started joning on me and making fun of me in front of people, and you can say, and it, it just it really hurt me. You, can, you value validate that. You know what? I can see how that would have hurt. That was inappropriate for me to do that. Because a lot of people, this is so important, because a lot of people wanna, don't want to be made to feel like they're crazy for feeling that way. Because some people who are gaslighters will make you feel terrible that you even brought this to them. Oh, and they'll have it, by the time they're, you're finished, they'll have you thinking you crazy for even thinking joning on you is wrong. Y'all ain't never been gaslighted, I guess. So what validation does is say, you're right for feeling that way. I would have felt the same way. See, it's not, it's not the listener's job to put, the, put, put them people in their place. It's to put yourself in their place. And then once you understand, you know what? You're right. I'm so sorry. You apologize. I'm so sorry for the pain that I caused you. And please, I would hope that you would forgive me for that. I don't take your forgiveness lightly, and I know you might need time to think about that, but I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. Forgive me. But here's one of the most important things, and here's what you can guarantee going forward. I'm going to make amendments. I will never make fun of you like that again. I respect you that much. Now, that's a, that's a reconciliation conversation that took place because amendments are important because I don't want you to just apologize, and I, and I need you to understand for you apologize. Let's say you're trying to go to somebody, and you say, you say, uh, last Thursday. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know you complain, but I'm just sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Nah, never mind. You're not even listening to me. What are you apologizing for? Until you can get in touch with my pain, you don't even know what you're asking me to forgive you for. See, this is, this is serious, y'all. This has to be done from the heart. And I don't just want an apology without an amendment because even though you said you're sorry, if you're not going to change, I still don't trust being around you. Yeah. Now, let me tell you what, 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 let me tell you a story because I'd give y'all everything at this service. Years ago when I started this church, and I use this because this is the first place I learned it, uh, my assistant pastor was Pastor Jeff Simmons. And when we started Zion Church in 2000, I was trying to get people to come dress down and not wear church clothes. And we're trying to make this contemporary experience. This is 24 years ago. We all came from church. I didn't have casual clothes. I know y'all don't think I had, that's all I had was suits. I had suits and stuff to play basketball in. That was it. I ain't had nothing in between, right? So I was wearing suits to church even when I started Zion, believe it or not, but I was telling people, let's dress down, right? And I couldn't even do it myself. I was so used to being suited up. And then I started dressing down. But Pastor Jeff was, when I would meet with my leaders, 
Uh, sometimes he would say, yeah, that's his vision. But if I ever start a church, we ain't going to just wear suits. We're going to wear cassocks. And cassocks are these little fly-like Pentecostal robes that are fitted. You know what I'm saying? And he was going to have choir robes and all this stuff. And he would always shoot down, not always, in this meeting, he was shooting down my vision. So I addressed it with him after the meeting. I said, man, your words are too powerful. You're killing what I'm trying to start and what I'm trying to build. It's already an anomaly. You know, uh, it's killing me. And he was so convicted. He said, I'm so sorry for what I did. I won't do that again. And I'm like, we're good. We're good. We get to the next meeting. It's the fourth Saturday. This is when I learned this lesson. He came into the meeting. We back in the front of the same leaders. I'm trying to catch my vision. And he raised his hand. He said, can I say something? I was like, oh, Lord, now you ain't going to do this again. He said, I want you all to know something. Last fourth Sunday when I was in here, I disrespected our pastor. I went against his vision. And I said what I would do. This is not even my party. This is his party, and I want to support him. I already apologized to him, but I wanted to come back and apologize in the same environment where I did the wrong thing. I had never seen anything like that in my life. I'm like, who does that? I have taken that on. That's, that's, that's principle to me. Like, if you joned on me in the parking lot in front of six people, don't make fun of me in public and then in private say, yeah, you know, I'm just, no, no, no. Let's go back out here where the six people saw all that. You should be willing to do that and say, not only was it wrong for me to do this to this person, but it was wrong for y'all to even have to see something like that. I'm sorry to all of y'all. See, that's big league stuff right there. That's family of God stuff right there. That ain't street stuff. Don't be trying to make up in private what you messed up in public. Yeah. Own it at the level you blew it. Yeah. yeah. Now, Let's keep going. In verse 14, Paul addresses three groups. He says, I want you to do, watch this. He says, first of all, I want you to warn the people who are idle and disruptive. Then I want you to encourage the people who are disheartened. And then I want you to help the people who are weak. And then fourthly, this, this is everybody, I want you to be patient with everyone. Because again, the goal is to what? Love. One more time. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the ways we love each other is by warning people. We don't just encourage in this verse. Look at the bound. There it is again. It's not all encouragement. It's not all help. It's warning. Love will warn people who are disruptive. You can't just have one. You can't just have an environment where you can't be challenged. And everybody that challenges you is not toxic. Some people see stuff in you that needs to change. And I'm telling you, the people who are not saying it to you are saying it about you. You can believe that. You're being talked about. Would you rather that? Or you rather somebody come to you and say, hey, in love, I'm coming to you. And I see how you operate like this. I just think, you know, as a believer, I just want to encourage you. Like, can I help you with this? Can I challenge you in this? Can I tell you what I see? Now, if a person is open to that correction, they can grow. If they're in denial, like, like some people are in denial, like it's their own river, denial. <laughs> you can't even get through them because they, they try to carry themselves as if they do nothing wrong. Wow. So he says, I want you to do this. First, I want you to warn people. Some translations say idle. The NIV says idle and disruptive. Actually, disruptive is a better, def a better translation of that word because the word means to be without arrangement. It really means to be out of order. He's saying, in our church, we got to get people who are out of pocket and address them. Don't talk about them, talk to them. It takes courage and love to do that. Then he says, I want you to encourage, again, encourage people, but this time, encourage disheartened people. Disheartened people are spiritually despondent. That's what that means. It is somebody who, because of their circumstances, has literally given up their hope even in God. It is possible to be so hurt and so devastated by trauma and grief that people are even saying, God, how could you be good unless something this bad happened to somebody that's good? They can be stuck. And, you, and when you're encouraging somebody who's disheartened, be careful. Your words are not as important as just your empathy. People don't need a sermon in that case. Sometimes they just need a shoulder. 
Because Christians are always trying to give somebody a word. Be careful trying to give somebody a word and they're in an experience that you have no history with. If you've never been through that, you don't have a word for them. What people need in that time frame is restored hope. And here's what I do. When I'm in a situation where my theology collides with life, and life just doesn't seem like, how can, how can, this is too tragic. You ever see something so tragic? I don't even want to see that. I don't even want to see the footage. I don't want to see the news report of it. Like, it's, here's what I do, whether it's personal to me or close to me. I hold on to these two things. It's my, it's what uh, Walter Scott Thomas calls the battery pack. When you can't operate and you're not plugged in, you got to have something that keeps you going in your faith even when things don't look like your faith says they should be. And for one for me is Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I can't tell you how many times I've had to lean on that. When everything looked terrible, I had to believe, you know what, somehow all things are going to work together for the good. God is up to something. And even though this is not good and that's not good, it is going to work together for good. He didn't say all things are good, but he said they're going to work together for good. And sometimes you got to be able to hold on to that when everything is crumbling around you. God's going to get some good and some glory out of this situation. And the other thing I hold on to is that I used to, I remember a lady I remember named Naomi, Naomi Hoskins used to lead this song at the First Baptist Church at Highland Park. She would sing it from the congregation and the song would be, and we'll understand it better by and by. And I started hearing the faith of the seniors who didn't, didn't understand it now, but they say, one day this is going to make sense. And the song would say, by and by, when the morning comes, and all the saints of God are gathered at home, and we will tell the story of how we've overcome, and then we'll understand it better by and by. You, see, the one thing you got to have in order to make it through this life, you got to know that there's another life beyond this life. And you got to know that when we all get to heaven, we'll sing and shout the victory. Like, like there's got to, if all your hope is in this life, you're in trouble. There's got to be something beyond this light that, that will balance the sheets and, 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 and we will study war no more and we'll he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes and there's no more sorrow and no more suffering and no more pain. The land of no more, where the wicked cease from trouble, excuse me, and the weary are at rest, where every day will be Sunday and Sabbath will have no end. You got to have that kind of faith about eternity if you're going to make it through life. I'm not, I'm, and again, I'm not trying to judge you because pain is pain, but I'm saying get something in your battery pack that can keep you going with God when it's rough. Then he says, then he says, make sure you also help those who are weak. Don't just encourage those who are disheartened. Help those who are weak. The word weak there means strengthless. And it's a word that describes two types of weaknesses. It is either a physical malady or a social malady. It is a person who doesn't have the power to support themselves. Whether they're in a legal battle and they can't get justice or they're in a medical battle and they don't have physical strength. If you're in a weakness, watch this. And let me tell you this, keep on living and you'll face at least one of those in your life. And he says in the Bible, the strong must bear the infirmities of the weak. So when people are going through health challenges, when they're going through legal challenges, when they're going through hard times, we're supposed to help them, not judge them. We're supposed to help them because the goal is to what? Love each other. Love each other. Love each other. I'm almost done. Verse 15 says, and don't be petty. Do not pay back wrong for wrong. What I love about this is Paul is not just saying don't just do people wrong for no reason. He's saying, don't even do people wrong when they did you wrong first. Right. 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 Whoa, 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 whoa. Because cause see, we cool with like, I know I shouldn't do people wrong, but when they do us wrong, we so ready to finish it. You start it, I'll finish it. He said, don't finish it, flip it. Wow. Don't do people wrong because you are, here's what Pastor Jeff used to always say, you are responsible for your response. Just because somebody else went low don't mean you need to go down there. Sometimes you got to just walk away. 
When somebody acting up, acting crazy, wanting to fight and all that, and we in the fast food place, are you serious? How are we fighting in, how are we fighting in KFC? <laughs> like, what is in here that's we, we fighting? That was the last wing. I know I was here first. You cannot be that crazy. Like, you, there's some things that are not worth fighting over. You got to, when people act crazy, that's your cue. All right, y'all, we know it's, we had a good time. We'll see y'all next Easter. You got to walk away. Sometimes you got to scroll away. Sometimes you're on a page and you interact with somebody. Why are you going back and forth with somebody and you don't even know who they really are? This their page, they ain't got their picture up, they got a private page, and they do that stuff. Because, because sometimes you have to ignore ignorance. I know I had to tell myself that when people jump on my page with these private accounts, like coming after me, and I just say, ignore ignorance. You don't even know what you're talking about. Ignore ignorance. Because when you respond to ignorance, you make it seem like it's brilliance. Yeah, you do. If you respond to something ignorant, it makes them feel brilliant. I have just given, and I don't, I don't, if you're ignorant, I don't want to mislead you into thinking you're brilliant. <laughs> so what, how are we going to converse about this? You don't have enough information. I don't have enough time to give it to you. And you don't really want to understand anyway. You just want attention. Yeah. Wow. And sometimes you got to also just understand that hurt people hurt people. When people come at you, like even your children or somebody in your family just come at you, you know, somebody come at you and they like real over the top. They went to 10 on you. Hurt people hurt people. When you go, when somebody goes to 10 on you on something that should be a two, that other eight ain't you. So you just got to leave that alone because I can't go to 10 right now. I'm not going to 10 with you. That ain't, that other eight ain't even about me. You didn't manage the other eight. So this was your time to explode. You just got to back up and let things go. So if you can't return wrong for wrong, what do you do? Look at the rest of the verse. You strive to do good. It's not going to be easy. Strive to do good for each other. And number 10, strive to do good for others, for, for everyone else. It's not just people in the church. It's people outside the church. So, so because people outside the church are watching us. They're watching how we behave, how we interact. They're seeing if our faith is real. They're watching us. It's just like if a person plays baseball and a batter is up in a batter's box, if a pitcher intentionally hits him with a baseball, that's a very painful thing. And in that moment, everybody is watching the batter. The batter is in control of the entire environment. If the batter lays his bat down and walks to home, first plate, first base, nothing will happen. If the batter throws his helmet down, rushes the mound, both dugouts, both bullpens, it's a brawl. Because the response, the batter is responsible for, it doesn't make what the pitcher did right, he just went wrong for wrong. The problem is he got everybody else fighting too. And the reason why our reactions are so important is because the people that love us are watching. And if we snap, they're going to they gonna pull their earrings out and pull their sleeves up too. Now you got people in their 60s out in the driveway fighting. And when you 60 fighting, you're going to get hurt trying to duck a punch. <laughs> you're just like, man, how you get down there? Man, my knee snapped when I was leaning. Did he hit you? Nah, man, I ducked it, but my knee broke. <laughs> now you got four ambulances at the house because you decided to match wrong for wrong. Like, it matters. Love each other. When people are going off and going crazy, you never know if you handle it calmly, you may have a chance later on to talk to that person when things are calm and actually make friends. You see? It's possible. I'm sure some of you had that happen if you do it. If you decide to just let a person go with their road rage, just get out the way. I'm not going to even go back and forth. You're not going, you know, let me get out your way. Because obviously, you know, I'm not going to try to slow you down. Because you, if you're driving that fast, you certainly don't need to pull over to fight me. Because you obviously, I don't want to slow you down. I'm trying to help you, right? Let me get the last one. Verse 26, it says, greet each other with a holy kiss. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. In context, when you see something like this, you have to always study, like, is this a a time-sensitive local application 
to a particular group of people in Thessalonica. We know in Greco-Roman and Jewish culture, it was, it was their custom that they would greet each other with kisses. Men would kiss men, women would kiss women. That was how they, but the kiss wasn't, it wasn't sensual. They would kiss each other on the forehead or they might kiss on each cheek or they would kiss the hand. It was part of their custom. It is still that way in some, some cultures. It is not that way in our culture. The way we greet each other is usually with a hug. Can I get it? Thank you, Pastor Larry. You've been here all day. So this is the standard. I don't know who started this, but I've never seen a man that we don't greet each other like this. This is what we do. Bam, bam. That's, how, that's like the standard, the standard hug for men. That's what we do. We do like that. It ain't, it's just like, hey, what up, though? You know what I'm saying? You can be in Myrtle Beach. This is what we're going to do. You can be in Maryland. It don't matter. That's what we're going to do. Now, women... Uh, y'all don't do that. Y'all don't do this when y'all, when women hug each other, they don't do nothing. I don't know what y'all do. I just, y'all just go straight in. I don't know. <laughs> we don't usually do that. We just do this here like, hey, hey, you know what I'm saying? That's what we do. Now, when you're in church and you hug a woman, because it says be holy. <laughs> so this is how we hug ladies. This is what we do. We come up on a lady. Hey, hey, you know, sis, hey, praise the Lord. You know what I'm saying? It's like, hey, you, know, it's, it's, you know, it's a lot of perversion out there, a lot of sensuality and stuff, and we got to have boundaries. So, we just, you know, it's kind of like, hey, you pray out of family. <laughs> watch this. Watch this. See, the key is the greeting. It says greet each other with a holy the greeting should be holy. That's not just purity, it's sincerity. Yeah. Don't hug me if you don't mean it. Because Judas kissed Jesus, but it wasn't holy. So if you don't hug me, that means we need to have a conversation. But don't hug me if you don't mean it. I need to know how you really feel, right? And be, be, because what greeting, what greeting somebody with love says is that this is a safe space. You're loved. You're valued. You're appreciated. We, because we're family. That's the goal. To make people know that they are loved. Now, for those of you, how many of you would say, you know, there's certain people I see on a regular basis, but I never, never hug them. For whatever reason. Maybe you, you don't want to seem inappropriate. How many of you know somebody that you see regularly that you don't hug? For whatever reason, right? L let me show you why we should consider overcoming that and how we may be able to do it. Now, Let's say that person that you don't typically hug, you see them in, their, in verse 14. They're in a position where they are totally disheartened. They're despondent. They're suffering in grief. They're crying. They're overwhelmed. Or they're in verse 14 and they're weak. They're experiencing medical condition. They are at their end of their rope. They're in a tough situation. And you see them crying and broken down you are more apt in that situation to reach out and give them a hug. And what I'm saying is, why do people have to be in shambles for us to show them love? Why does it have to get that bad? It's like, you know, oh, you good? <laughs> How you doing? How you been? But if you're in shambles, oh, I'm so sorry you're going through that. Why can't we just say, hey, are you good all the time? I'm just saying there's something to think about. I'm trying to obey the Bible. I'm not trying to start anything. I'm just saying, like, in my life, I try to see, okay, God, where am I coming up short in this area? And I think we could all do a better job of greeting one another in a loving way. Even the people who live in our homes. Or the people, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. Some of you ain't gonna have no problem hugging your bestie. You know? Some of y'all just, y'all, like, huggy lowdown. You just hug all the time. <laughs> it's gonna be the people that are difficult to love. Can we love them? And I'm saying we can in our own power. But Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. Yeah. How did he love you? The love of Jesus for us is absolutely, it is, it is, it doesn't make sense. I don't even have a word for it. Maybe I had one earlier, but it's 1.30. I can't even think of a word for it. It is inexplicable. Like, who would love that way? I'm not talking about when you love somebody and they let you down and you still love them. I'm talking about somebody who loves you, knows you're going to let them down, can see the let down when you're promising them you're not. And that, it's not like Jesus has to wait for us to let them down to see it. Yeah, yeah. 
Like he already knows that we lie when we say, I'll never do that again. Like he can see us Friday doing it. And I still love you. Like God not only loves us, he adores us. Let's pray. Lord, help us to not just hear these words, but help us to really love each other. May this family be a reflection of how you want us to be and operate. And we pray for your help to do it in Jesus' name. Amen.